Good evening, everyone. We're, we're so pleased that you could uh, take time from your evening to join us for this webinar. We're pleased to be able to offer tonight's program, Dystonia, an Overview and Treatment Options. My name is Janet Hyshutter, and it's my privilege to serve as the Executive Director for the DMRF and to welcome all of you here tonight. We had a wonderful response to this webinar, and we want to make sure that everyone will benefit from this. So as you may have noticed in your reminder email, there are two options for listening to the audio portion of tonight's webinar, voice over IP, which uses your computer speakers, or via your telephone. Please make sure that uh, the correct option is chosen in the audio pane of your attendee control panel. If you have chosen to use your telephone, please make sure you enter the audio pin provided to you and turn down the speakers on your computer uh, so that you don't get a lot of feedback. The webinar will be recorded and placed on the DMRF website for future reference. I want to give a special shout out and thank you to our support group leaders who are joining us tonight. Uh, they are an important dystonia resource for those who are affected by dystonia, and we're so pleased that so many of you could be with us, and I know you'll find this information helpful as you help others. Uh, your questions are an important part of the program, and we encourage you to write them down as you think of them. We'll do our best to address all of them in the time that we have for tonight. We may not get to all of them, and I apologize in advance for that, but please know that the questions you offer help the DMRF to identify topics for articles in the, in the Dystonia Dialogue and for our other written resources. So uh, we will take the questions at the end of the presentation tonight and um, present them to all three of our speakers. If you have any um, technical difficulties during the webinar, please make sure you email jo Jody Roosevelt um, at jroosevelt at dystonia-foundation.org. Her address is on the screen there. Um, and she will do her best to assist you. So now on to our program. Uh, just a word, the, the DMRF was founded nearly 40 years ago with a mission to support research that will lead to more effective treatments and ultimately a cure to support awareness and education and because we know that research never moves fast enough for those who are waiting, the DMRF is also committed to providing support to those who are affected and to their families. We take our responsibility in providing you with accurate information very seriously, and the DMRF is proud of the resources that we offer the community. Tonight we have a wonderful program um, and a fabulous faculty for this educational resource. Dr. Allison Brashear is Chair of, uh, and Professor of Neurology at Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center. She is a leader in the American Academy of Neurology. She's involved in the Movement Disorder Society and a an, an host of other organizations. She is well published and her research focuses on movement disorders. Dr. Brashear received her medical degree from the University of Indiana and I'm pleased to say that Dr. Brashear has also served on the DMRF Medical and Scientific Advisory Council. Dr. Ishtam Hauk is an assistant professor of neurology at Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center. He received his medical degree from State University of New York Medical College. He did his residency in neurology at Georgetown and a fellowship in neurology at the University of Florida. Dr. Jessica Tate is also an assistant professor of neurology at Wake Forest. Dr. Tate received her medical degree from West Virginia School of Medicine. She did her residency and a fellowship in movement disorders at Wake Forest. We are so pleased to have all of them with us tonight. And at this point, I will turn the program over to our, um, our speakers. Thank you. So this is Dr. Bashir. Thank you, Janet. We're really pleased to be here, and um, we're delighted to be able to present to you an overview of dystonia, the treatment options. I think you'll find the program very informative, uh, particularly the information about D, uh, DBS and the pathophysiology of dystonia, or what we know of it at this time. I'm very pleased to um, bring with, uh, to you uh, our movement disorder program here, which is, uh, as many of you know, um, provides treatment, diagnosis, and research in, uh, for patients with dystonia. So I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Huck, and then he's going to take you through pathophysiology, and then Dr. Tate and I will be back in with some more information on treatment. Hello, everyone. This is Adesham Huck. Uh, thank you for having me, and um, I appreciate your attendance this evening. I wanted to outline first what we intend to do tonight, three things. 
want to talk a little bit about what dystonia is and what causes it and go into a little bit about the brain pathways that are involved there. We'll move from there to talk about uh, the presentations of dystonia, how those pathway changes end up producing the features that you all are familiar with, and then finally talk about uh, treatment options, both medical um, Botox and uh, deep brain stimulation. So let me start telling you about that. Well, it's easiest to start with a definition to make sure we're all talking about the same thing. So I just created some stuff from the uh, DMR, DMRF website. And what I cribbed was this, that dystonia is essentially a disorder of movement, of course, otherwise we'd be the wrong people to talk about it. But what it is, is an issue of the muscles contracting and not relaxing appropriately. The muscles simply tighten up and remain so. Now, another key component of the definition is that it's not just that random muscle groups tighten and relax, but that muscle groups that normally don't act simultaneously do. So, for example, your biceps and triceps might both tighten up at the same time, leaving your arms stuck in a particular position, halfway between where you would want it to be. Oops. Sorry. Okay. Uh, and lastly, these movements can force your body into particular positions. So not only are you, do your muscles contract against your will, not only do muscles that shouldn't group together group together, but these can happen in particular patterns. For example, if you're neck muscles pull back and forth, that sawing motion can actually produce a tremor rather than just a fixed dystonia. Or if one group dominates, you can pull your head over and produce sort of the typical cervical dystonia that so many people have. So what causes it? I like to posit that dystonia is not so much a disease as a symptom. It's a little bit like talking about a cough. This is what we see in the end, this thing we call dystonia. But there are a lot of different ways to get to that particular end. Specifically, we think that damage to specific movement-related pathways is what causes dystonia. In other words, it's some issue with dysregulation. The mechanisms in the brain that normally control movement are impaired, and as a result, you see what you see in dystonia. And it can come in at least two basic ways. The damage can come from either an inherited difference in cell function. It's a bit of a mouthful, but there's nothing more than to say that just like we can inherit brown eyes or our height, you can inherit different ways of working your cellular machinery. And for folks with dystonia, like the rest of us, it mostly works. Sometimes it doesn't work in one out of maybe a thousand or maybe even a hundred thousand moving pieces. And that little piece, over time, ends up being very, very relevant. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. Or you can suffer an injury later in life. So, of course, you can damage those pathways the same way you might hurt your arm. Uh, you could have a stroke. You could have a head injury. And if the right pathways are affected, you get the same effects as if you'd had that um, sort of developing abnormality all along. And the pathways involved are the connections of the parts of the brain called the basal ganglia. So I think it's probably a good point to talk about the basal ganglia. There they are, pretty complicated looking, I think, or at least I thought when I first saw them. Um, what you're talking about here, let me try to serve as your guide a little bit, is the core parts of the brain which help to regulate motion in one way or another. They all kind of act as a group, parceling out different features and functions in different ways, doing different things, but all in the end, controlling movement. The reason they're at the center they are physically at the center of the brain, is that they're at the center of most of what we do. Uh, the connections from the cortex all kind of route through the basal ganglia. They're there at the center because it's the easiest way to reach everything at once. So let me tell you a little bit about its pieces. So as I've mentioned, the basal ganglia are those parts of the brain that regulate motion uh, and also position, which I guess is a feature of motion. Position changes over time is what uh, I guess motion is properly defined as. The key parts. There's a part called the striatum that you can see up there. There it's labeled caudate nucleus and cutamen. It's up towards the front. And that serves as sort of the motivation center. I hope that those of you who are experts in this, you'll accept that I am generalizing some, but not past the point of usefulness. Uh, this is largely what the striatum does. It hooks up to the front parts of our brain that are responsible for so much of our personality and what makes us what we are. Uh, and diseases that affect the striatum first, like Huntington's disease, have dystonia associated with them, but first, almost invariably, affect how we feel emotionally or how much we feel like doing anything at all. Next, the thalamus. That's there at the core. 
literally at the center of the brain. That acts as a switchboard. So I said before the basal ganglia are at the center of the brain. Well, the thalamus is at the center of the basal ganglia, and everything routes through there. So it coordinates everything. Uh, between higher and lower order function, the thalamus in the end is what's responsible for turning a thought into a movement. There's a cerebellum, which is primarily responsible for keeping movement smooth. So anyone who's ever been drunk knows what happens when your cerebellum is impaired. Your movements become erratic and irregular. And this is particularly relevant to dystonia, in which the movements are anything but smooth. And lastly, the globus pallidus, which acts as a break and is the end output nucleus. Well, what do I mean by that? I said everything routes through the basal ganglia, so it can come in by a lot of ways, uh, the information that is, but in the end, most of it leaves via the globus pallidus, which is also important because it makes it a very tempting target for therapies of various types. So since there are many parts of the basal ganglia, there are many ways to arrive at dystonia. The distribution defines the disease. I ran through what some of these different parts do so you can see how if there was a, a dystonia that in which the cells that were in the cerebellum were primarily affected, you have mostly movement impaired, but your motivation and your overall processing would probably be mostly okay. On the other hand, if your dystonia was from a stroke that also happened to affect your caudate, part of the striatum, it would be expected to have pretty profound mood effects as well. Uh, sort of, well, again, what features you see depend on where you uh, have affected the brain. So I want to go back to those two basic causes that I talked about, inherited dystonias versus acquired dystonias. Inherited dystonias come from changes in basic cell processes. Like I said, just one piece of that magnificent collection of machinery just doesn't work quite as it should. In particular, two different things. It can be, uh, okay, Oops. sorry about that. Well, we'll just work with that. So they can change in, as I said, there's two basic ways. They can change how much energy those cells need. So for those of you who are familiar with mitochondria, we'll recognize those as the energy powerhouses of the cell. For those of you who are not, well, you're not missing much. There are a lot of ways to affect how much energy a cell needs and how it uses that energy. In short, if you impair that process, there may come a time where you demand more from your cells than they, than you, they can give, and they burn out. So another alternative way in which you can get dystonia is your cells can become unable to dump their waste. In other words, well, there are a lot of ways that the cells work to sort of metabolize and get rid of their trash. If they don't get rid of it, um, you get more than just a stink. You get a local destruction of the cell eventually. And depending on which cell that is, you can get one symptom or another. If they're in the basal ganglia, you can get a dystonia. The reason I take some time to mention these is it's relevant to what the symptoms can look like. This energy demand that's affected, if what's happening is that particular cells are asked too much of and then just die, then they'll appear after exercise or bodily stresses. Rapid onset dystonia Parkinsonism, something Dr. Brashear is a world expert in, is such a dystonia. So there the dystonia appears after, oh, well, maybe someone goes out and goes dancing. Or maybe they have uh, a drink, something they have, may have done a hundred times before, but this time, for whatever reason, it's more than those cells can handle, and that process of degradation starts, and all of a sudden dystonia pops up as a feature. There you'd expect sort of a, a stepwise worsening where further stresses cause an increase in symptoms. Where is, if it's an accumulation, if your cells are just gradually building stuff up inside them, it will take time to show. Enough cells have to be affected. Each cell has to be affected enough. And the symptoms will probably be slight at first. I mean, it's usually not an all or none thing. Cells are gradually and increasingly impaired. And so for the same reason, it might worsen over time. If the issue is an accumulation, that accumulation will be expected to continue. That said, if only particular cells are affected, say in the cerebellum or the globus pallidus, the dystonia could be relatively limited because those cells, even if severely affected, are the only cells affected. And again, it's worth reiterating, what regions affected determines what the symptoms might be. Oh, that's my bit. I will turn it over to Dr. Tate now to talk about presentation. So we'll talk a little bit about um, what dystonia can look like. Sorry. There you go. Hopefully it will work here. 
So. Okay, we'll just, we'll just go from here. Um, so as Dr. Huck touched on already, um, in general, dystonia causes um, involuntary muscle contractions that can lead to either um, inner or kind of a sustained abnormal um, can begin really at any time of life from infancy to childhood to adulthood. Um, again, depending on the area or areas of the body that are involved, dystonia can look very different from one person to another. Um, dystonia can be present in isolation, so it can be kind of the only movement abnormality that someone um, has, or it can be combined with other movement disorders um, like Parkinsonism or uh, myoclonus, for example. Um, and the contractions involved in uh, dystonia may or may not be painful. <laughs> Sorry, we're having some trouble getting these to advance. They just want to buy you. There you go. That work? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so they're just popping up very, very slowly. Um, so, so dystonia may be isolated to one part of the body. Um, and in that situation, we refer to it as focal dystonia. So um, just some examples are um, involvement of only the neck and shoulder muscles, which um, can be referred to as cervical dystonia or is also known as um, spasmodic torticollis. Um, that's the most common form of focal dystonia. It can involve the eyelids alone, and in that case we call it blepharospasm. Um, it can involve the hand or, and or forearm muscles, uh, in which case we call it writer's cramp. And It can also involve the um, oral, um, the oral muscles in the jaws, lips, or tongue. Um, in that case, we call it oromandibular dystonia. Um, it can also focally involve the vocal cords, um, and that's referred to as spasmodic dysphonia. So um, just touching individually on cervical dystonia for a few moments, um, we already discussed um, you know, dystonia can, can cause muscles to assume sort of a fixed abnormal posture. Um, in cervical dystonia, that can, uh, that can vary. It can involve twisting or rotation of the head to one side, which we call um, torticollis, tilting of one ear toward the shoulder, or lateralcollis, um, elevation of the shoulder, tilting of the head forward or backward, which would be anterocollis or retrocollis, or a combination of multiple of these movements. In cervical dystonia, uh, dystonic contractions of opposing muscle groups uh, can also lead to a, an at least somewhat rhythmic back and forth movement uh, or tremor. And so for that reason, sometimes cervical dystonia ends up misdiagnosed as another disorder, such as essential tremor. Uh, because it can look, the head tremor can look similar. People uh, with cervical dystonia may have what we call a sensory trick, which is a voluntary action like lightly touching the face that can correct the abnormal posture briefly or um, temporarily alleviate the abnormal movement that the person is experiencing. In addition to being focal, um, dystonia could also affect two or more adjacent parts of the body. We call that segmental dystonia, or one side of the body, such as uh, the left arm and left leg. We would call that hemidystonia. Um, dystonia can also be generalized, and that means that many different areas of the body can be involved at once. So the trunk and some or all of the limbs can be affected, causing twisting and spasms. 
symptoms of dystonia can be present all the time or only some of the time. Um, when they appear as discrete attacks with relatively normal periods in between, we call this paroxysmal dystonia. Um, when they're triggered only by a very specific activity, we call this task-specific task dystonia. So examples would be uh, a musician who uh, repetitively um, uses the same finger movements to play a musical instrument um, or with handwriting. Um, dystonia can also be divided into inherited causes, so basically meaning it's of genetic origin, um, as Dr. Huck touched on. Um, it can also be acquired, and that's usually the result of some known structural cause um, when someone's had a stroke, a head trauma of some kind, um, or cerebral palsy, or as the result of a drug reaction, um, which can occur with um, medications like metoclopramide or neuroleptic medications. So now we'll, we'll touch a little bit on how dystonia can be treated. So there are multiple um, oral medication options. Um, the drugs that we do use for dystonia are considered um, off-label use. That means uh, they're medications that are FDA approved for other um, indications but are not specifically FDA approved to treat dystonia. Um, but in our experience, they, they can work. Um, anticholinergic drugs are commonly used, so those would include trihexyphenidyl, um, brand name Artane, or benztropine, which is also known as cogentin. Um, the potential side effects of anticholinergic drugs sometimes limit their use, so a common complaint is dry mouth, um, sedation and confusion can also occur, um, and that's definitely more common in older age groups as well. GABAergic drugs, which affect a specific neurotransmitter in the body, um, would include benzodiazepines. There are multiple medications within that class, but the ones that we probably most commonly use are either diazepam um, or clonazepam. Um, baclofen is also an option. Uh, the potential side effects of those, um, of those particular drugs are, again, sedation. There's also potential with either benzodiazepines or baclofen for a potentially serious withdrawal reaction, so you have to be cautious about um, their use. Uh, we sometimes use dopamine depleting drugs, um, which actually um, kind of block dopamine receptors. Tetrabenazine, which is approved for treatment of Huntington's disease, um, is sometimes used. Um, again, potential side effect of sedation. We also have to be cautious in patients that have a history of depression, um, and we, there's some potential risk that it could lead to Parkinsonism since it does affect the dopamine system. Um, this particular drug might be particularly helpful in patients with tardive dystonia, which is the type that is uh, caused as a result of medication use like neuroleptics or metoclopramide. Um, we can also use um, dopamine stimulating drugs or dopaminergic drugs. Um, so those would include carbidopa, levodopa. Um, there are multiple brand name forms, but probably the most common is Cinemet. Um, there are also dopamine agonists, such as Repinerol or Primapexol. Um, and these drugs work very well for specific inherited types of dystonia. Um, the most notable one is DYT5, which is also known as dopa-responsive dystonia or Sagawa syndrome. Um, so often, especially um, in patients who present at young ages with dystonia, um, childhood or young adulthood, um, you know, a doctor may prescribe a trial of levodopa um, just to kind of rule out dopa responsive dystonia if any suspicion exists. Um, I'll turn this back over to Dr. Brashear for a moment to talk about botulinum toxin. So as everybody knows, uh, botulinum toxin is a treatment uh, for dystonia. It's generally saved for the focal dystonias, and we're not going to have time today to go into all of the forms of focal dystonia and the individual treatments. But as we all know, there are multiple forms of botulinum toxin. Essentially, there's two serotypes, type A and type B, that are used to treat focal dystonia. All of these forms are approved for treatment of cervical dystonia in the United States. Others are approved for other forms of dystonia, um, but 
the injections for dystonia can vary. Um, the most common injections are in the neck muscles, but then it can also be given in the eyelids, in the vocal cords, in the limb for limb dystonia, writer's cramp. So generally, if the muscles are overactive, the site can be injected. This is a diagram of the muscles for the neck that are injected, and I put this in here just to, to talk a little bit about anatomy. So when patients are being injected with botulinum toxin, it's important that the physicians know about anatomy. The muscles of the neck um, are working in a um, relaxation and contraction modality to turn the head. And so the abnormalities with cervical dystonia come when those things don't work. The injections of botulinum toxin essentially act to relax the muscles or loosen the muscles. And then it's important to choose the right dose in the right muscle to relax the muscles and then therefore straighten the head. For example, the sternocleidomastoid, which is this muscle right here where I'm pointing the arrow, um, is the head, the one that turns the head to the opposite direction. So the right sternocleidomastoid would turn the head to the left. So if you're trying to do treat with botulinum toxin, the head turned to the left, you would inject the right sternocleidomastoid. However, other muscles, such as the splenius capitis, which is here, is involved in either turn or tilt tilt to the one side or um, uh, turn to the one side. So it can be treated um, for different types of muscles. And then also this is a posterior injection and posterior uh, schema. Now if you're injecting arms or legs for a foot dystonia or rider's cramp or lids, the dose varies. The amount that you put in varies. and then the technique even varies, whether you're using EMG or stimulation. However, all of the forms of botulinum toxin will act to relax the muscles, and they all work locally on the muscle. So the injections are given locally through a variety of mechanisms, which I'm going to show here, but they go locally, they act locally at the presynaptic nerve terminal and they work there to interfere with the way the nerve and the muscle communicate. So all of the brain diagrams that were discussed earlier are the messages coming out to the peripheral nervous system from the brain out into the nerves and muscles, and the toxin works locally at the nerve and muscle interface. This is a typical needle that we might use to inject a patient using EMG guidance. This is an EMG machine that is typically used to treat patients with um, overactive muscles. And the uh, needle is attached to a syringe, which the botulinum toxin is injected through. If the patient is getting injections in very fine, small muscles, one might use a much smaller needle um, that is what uh, is typically called a tuberculin syringe to do injections, say, on the eyelid. This is a relatively new piece of equipment called the clavis that actually has an EMG output and also stimulation output. It's typically used for in the clinic when you don't have a big machine like this one or if you're trying to do limbs and stimulate muscles, and for example, in a patient with a musician's dystonia who might have an involuntary movement of, say, one finger. You need to try to localize that one finger and you want to relax it just enough that it doesn't interfere with their fine playing of a violin. And then lastly is ultrasound. So some people are beginning to use ultrasound for injections in the neck. It's oftentimes used for injections of the parotids or the submandibular glands. Um, it's sometimes used for injections in the limb. Uh, but again, it's a different piece of equipment. All of these pieces of equipment can be helpful in the right hands, but all of these pieces of equipment are tied to the fact of whether the injector has knowledge of the anatomy. That said, there are also individuals who don't use this kind of equipment and do great and get great results. So it's really what your physician is used to, trained to, feels comfortable with, that are all uh, 
things that we might use to treat patients with botulinum toxin. So we talked about whether you EMG or not. There have been studies to, that talk about whether EMG is more helpful. Um, I've had a number of patients come to me and ask me if I use EMG or don't use EMG. Um, typically, if a patient has had a non-guided EMG injection for cervical dystonia, then we would typically try to use EMG. Uh, but again, it depends on what you're injecting, how simple the movements are, what the person's training is, and also how refractory that person may be. There are a variety of outcome scales that are used to evaluate patients with uh, dystonia. There are generalized dystonia rating scales, then there are also focal dystonia scales. I put this up here because this is one of the most common uh, rating scales that's been, that's been done with um, uh, toracolis. And so these are used in many of the clinical trials to determine uh, about turning, tilting, and it's a way to quantitate. It has the motor severity, it also has the disability rating scale on whether or not you have difficulty with reading, watching TV, driving, et cetera. And then the pain. We all know that pain is a significant part of cervical dystonia and, some, and oftentimes and many other forms of dystonia. So the last piece skipped ahead, is whether or not um, injections work or don't work. So there's been a lot of talk in the literature about immunology and whether people are immune to injections. And really, there's very, three reasons why any type of botulinum toxin injections don't work. One is too little drug was used, so the dose was too little for the bulk of the muscle or the overactivity of the muscle. And that's really learned by trial and error. And there's a, some charts around that really each practitioner had learned uh, a particular technique. And there's a range of doses for um, little muscles like the eyelid and big muscles like uh, the foot um, or the, the calf. The medicine is put in the wrong place. So if your head is turning to the left and you treat uh, the left sternocleidomastoid, um, then that might not necessarily work. Uh, again, no, neck movements can be very complicated and sometimes physicians are trying to balance them out. But again, it could be put in the wrong place. And then very unusual is immunity. So patients can develop an immunity to certain forms of botulinum toxin. If you develop immunity to type A, you'll be immune to type A. And if you develop immunity to type B, you'll be immune to type B. In the last several years, I've seen far less patients with immunity since uh, drugs have been reformulated and physicians are not using booster injections. And so it's very unusual now to see patients who have developed and immunity to botulinum toxin. Now certainly patients have times where they feel like one injection doesn't work and that's not unusual for patients to come in and say, you know, the last one just really didn't seem to work as well. Oftentimes there's some, inner, uh, some other illness or medication change or stressors, but if the, the injections don't work at all two times in a row, it's time to talk to your doctor about a reevaluation. And lastly, some pearls are conversion factors. We try to really emphasize that type B and type A and the subclasses of type A, all the drugs are different and there's no conversion factor. All the drugs need to be started low. Even though these drugs are used for, for cosmetic reasons, in the doses that we use for patients with dystonia, you still need to start low and work up. They are definitely drugs, in fact, um, that need to be monitored by a physician and injected by a physician. Each patient is different. Each patient's going to have a different response. Some people need more, some people need less, but each patient needs to really develop a relationship. And for physicians, it's hard to move around from place to place. And then lastly, keep asking questions. So now I'm going to turn it back over to my colleagues so that we can talk a little bit about DBS. Okay, so we'll close out by talking about what to do if medications and injections aren't doing what needs to be done.
So DBS, for dystonia, is something many of you will have heard of, but for those who have not, we're basically talking about the placement of electrodes into the brain uh, for the control of dystonic symptoms. In other words, putting the electrodes in and using, it, using them much like you might use a pacemaker to change the abnormal signal in the area. So a lot of people wonder, and a lot of people continue to work on, exactly how it is that DBS works. It seems to be DBS works by overriding bad signal. We talked a little bit about in the beginning about how the basal ganglia loops, if impaired, end up producing an abnormal result, um, in this case dystonia. What's happening there is that the electrical signals um, have changed and are now being misinterpreted by the body for one reason or another. And you can't really fix that signal, but if you block it or if you override it with static, the brain can manage and kind of route around it. So that's what DBS does. The usual target is a particular region in what was called the globus pallidus. So the globus pallidus is that end nucleus I was talking about. And since everything in the end routes through there, it is a very ripe region for stimulation. And most centers, neurologists and neurosurgeons work together to target the electrode. So I've been talking, I have been talking a little bit about how different things were located in different places and how what was affected uh, determined what symptoms you had. But here in DBS, really, location, location, location is what it's all about. So uh, a neurologist makes sure that the right patients are funneled to the neurosurgeon. The person truly has a dystonia and they truly have exhausted other treatments. And the neurosurgeon brings his or her expertise to bear to make sure that the electrode goes to just the right spot. As I mentioned, patient selection is crucial. The last thing you want to do is to funnel a person into DBS who's not going to benefit from it. DBS does appear to be less effective for acquired dystonias, unfortunately. In other words, if you have dystonia from a stroke uh, or from some other type of injury, usually the pathways are so disrupted or the repair around those pathways is so pervasive that the simple changes that DBS produces simply aren't enough to produce good effect. But DBS works really well for genetic dystonias, or at least many genetic dystonias, and also works very well for dystonias that are due to drug exposure. So I'm going to talk a little bit, just briefly, about what we do for targeting. Whoop. So what this is is a picture of the thalamus from the side. and. Very quickly, I want to give you a rough idea of what it is that I do in the operating room to help the neurosurgeons out. What this diagram is, is a, a series of readouts of what cellular firing patterns look like. And what I do in the OR is I listen to them. As one of my mentors once said, figuring out where you are in the basal ganglia is a lot like leaning your head out the car window in a, on, during a road trip through Europe and figuring out what country you're in by what language people are speaking around you. In other words, things sound different in different places. If you listen to those differences, you can tell what location you should be in. So just to give you a sample, uh, this is the firing pattern of the, uh, that you might hear from the thalamus, if I can hopefully get it to work for you all. Now, we'll let that go. It sounds a lot like static or Velcro, and the differences can be a little bit hard to pick up. What you do is you let a microelectrode, a sensing electrode that listens to those cells, descend a couple of times. Each time it descends, you declare at various depths what kinds of cells you're hearing. And you can see here how if you tag those different cells and overlay them on a map, in this case of the globus pallidus, you can get an idea of whether where you are is actually where you think you are. And so it brings sort of another level to localization that really benefits our dystonic patients in particular, for whom precise placement in the globus pallidus is crucial. So I wanted to show you a quick video of a patient of mine who is implanted with DBS electrodes. This is his pre-implantation video. He has a genetic dystonia, one of the more common kinds called DYT1. As you can see, he has a lot of trouble even standing straight with a lot of flexion at the hips uh, and a lot of scissoring, a lot of toe pointing that, again, just really doesn't let him walk. This is him after implantation, about, I think, six months after implantation. 
He still has a little bit of dystonia. You can probably cast that he's not standing quite straight and that his foot turns in a little bit, but I think the results speak for themselves. So we'd like to uh, conclude our presentation here and then open it up uh, for questions. We particularly want to thank the DMRF organizers, Janet, Jessica, and Jody, who've worked hard on this, and then my colleagues, uh, Dr. Huck and Dr. Tate, who uh, really uh, did an excellent presentation and overview of all the uh, uh, treatments. Uh, we wouldn't be uh, uh, remiss if we didn't mention the um, program for movement disorders here at Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center, uh, which includes all of the treatments that you've seen uh, here. And so with that, I think we'd like to open it up to questions. Great. Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful presentation and, and really terrific information. Um, I, the presentation answered a number of the questions that we've already received, so um, I think that's a sign of a wonderful presentation. Um, first question um, is, uh, how, how does the doctor determine the dose of the toxin um, that they're going to inject when a patient's being treated. Specifically, this questioner has cervical dystonia, but um, how, how is the dose determined? Dr. Brashear? Um, I think we lost our, our panel. Dr. Brashear, are you there? Uh, it seems that we're having a little bit of technical difficulty. My apologies to our, our guests. Dr. Brashear, are you there? Hi. Um, can you hear us? Okay. Oh, there you are. Thanks. Okay. We have no idea what happened. No problem. I, I, okay. I think we, no problem. So the question was um, for this particular person. Talking dose, right? Right. How do you determine the dose for, the, for uh, neuro, neurotoxin injections? So um, there have been doses in clinical trials, but basically what I do is decide which toxin I'm going to inject, and then I start with a kind of total dose for that patient. Um, that's based on basically their size, whether they've had any prior exposure to toxin, and um, and what their what their how severe their cervical dystonia is. There tend to be ranges on how much you would put in a sternocleidomastoid versus a splenius capitis and such. But it's really the first step is to start decide what, what you're going to treat them with, whether it's which of the drugs are you going to use, because they're dosed differently. Okay, thank you. Um, is dystonia progressive? Do you want me to go that one? Do you want to take Please. Please. Uh, so this is Dr. Hawk. It, it depends on the dystonia, really. So uh, one dividing line that studies suggest is the age of 26. So it looks like people who develop dystonias after around that age, which is probably an artifact of how they chose to divide the surveys, but still. Uh, if you're an adult when you develop dystonia, it's pretty unlikely to spread. Now, it may progress. In other words, if you have dystonia in your neck and it pops up when you're in your mid-30s, you may notice more dystonia over time, or you may not. Uh, but it's unlikely to affect anything besides your neck. Whereas if you are, say, six or seven and your foot starts turning in, it's probably a good time to start talking about DBS because that's going to progress and it's going to be refractory. Great, thank you. And, and on DBS, can you offer some advice as to how someone should go about selecting a DBS team that they might want to work with? This particular person is actually in Australia, but I think the question we certainly get at the DMRF frequently. How does one go about uh, selecting a team to work with for DBS? Uh, 
not, it's not that different than selecting a doctor for any other reason, but you can point out a couple of things to look for. Uh, DBS is something that depends on its precision, uh, on patient selection, and follow-up. So you want to go to a place that is usually going to be an academic center because you want to go to a place where you have a neurologist and a nurse surgeon working together. And that's just for the OR part. Uh, for patient selection, to make sure that they, we've really ruled out side effects, we have our folks see uh, a neuropsychologist, every single one, to look at cognition and to make sure the brain is functioning um, in ways that will not lead to problems once implanted. Uh, and often uh, a psychiatrist also, to make sure that there's no psychiatric risk. And then all those people follow up as well. So you want someone who's doing a multidisciplinary approach. That's the first part of my answer. The second part is you want to make sure that some place has done a lot of them. That's true for surgeries in general. The more folks have done, the better they tend to be at it. Uh, no surgeon, no physician will mind. I think you're asking um, how long they've been doing it for and how many cases they do. You want to know not just what the total number of cases is, but how many they do per year. Uh, if someone's been working for 15 years and has done 50 cases, well, then that's probably not what you want. Whereas if someone is has only been doing it for two years but has done 50 cases, that's pretty good. To give you an idea of how many we do, we did uh, 85 implantations here last year, 85 leads. Uh, and uh, so we we're pretty experienced. Um, anything else to, Dr. anything else you would add to that? I think that pretty much covered it. Good. Yeah, that, good. Thank you. That, that's helpful. Uh, th this person said that they've been um, diagnosed with psychogenic or functional dystonia, and they're wondering what exactly that means um, and whether or not they should seek a second opinion. Um, so it's, uh, uh, there's no blood test or imaging test for dystonia unless there's a genetic test like a DYT1. Uh, but psychogenic dystonia is thought to be not coming from the brain. Um, it is difficult to diagnose, and certainly if there's any questions, someone should seek a, seek a second opinion. Um, typically, it is associated with stressors, but everybody has stress in their life, so it's really a relationship that the person has with their physician and how they sort that out. And you commented on genetic testing. We've actually had a couple of questions from people. Um, so could you talk a little bit about um, what dystonias um, are, are known to be genetic and what the testing is for those dystonias? Uh -oh. I think the sound cut out on your end. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, we've had a, a couple of questions about genetic testing. So can hello? you comment on that? So I think we missed part of the question. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So the question, we've had a couple of questions around yes. genetics and genetic testing. Um, could you talk a bit about that? Sure. Um, I mean, there are not genetic tests available for every type of dystonia by far. Um, there are a few specific um, genes that we have identified. Um, that are labeled as DYTs. Um, so some of the ex some of the examples are um, DYT1, which is a type of generalized dystonia that often starts in childhood. Um, DYT5, which I mentioned earlier, which is um, a the dopa responsive type of dystonia. Um, DYT11, which is myoclonus dystonia. Um, rapid onset dystonia Parkinsonism. Yeah, we seem to be having some audio problems. My apologies for that. Dr. Tate, are you there? And we have a clinical suspicion based on... Can you hear us? We, we can hear you now. We, we, we lost you there for a minute, but you're back now. Thank you. And now we've lost you again. Are you guys there? 
My apologies to everyone. We, we seem to be having some technical difficulties tonight. We've had some excellent questions, and I think what I'd like to suggest that we do is uh, we will... Can you hear me? This is Allison. We can, we can hear you. Okay, great. So uh, we can answer questions from the phone here. Oh, okay. Okay, good. How can we help you? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not sure where I got cut off exactly before, but I, I mean, I was basically starting to say that with the, the genetic test, um, if we assess the patient and, you know, we have a suspicion based on their symptoms um, for one of those specific genetic forms of, of dystonia or the DYT, um, then, you know, of course, we will send the genetic test. Um, you know, if, if, it, if, it, if the presentation doesn't fit, um, that might not be something we would pursue. I mean, they're expensive tests. Um, and you know are not necessary um, in every in every case. So it's just kind of an individual um, an individual thing. Thanks. That's that's helpful. So people should really talk to their physicians about testing. Yes, definitely. Okay, great. Um, so uh, how does alcohol affect cervical dystonia? Okay, so for most people, the answer is not much. Uh, I mean, we talked about some of the medications that can help. But yes, for true isolated cervical dystonia, not much. We'll, we'll touch on the other subtypes. Uh, but for just isolated cervical dystonia, just as the other GABAergic medications, things like baclofen, uh, other muscle relaxants, and benzodiazepines can help, the central nervous system suppression of uh, alcohol we can temporarily reduce well, we can temporarily reduce the stony also wow <laughs> hello sorry i think you need to turn your speakers down on your computer okay. we're just getting feedback yeah. cuz you're on the phone okay but apparently you can hear us through the computer now so we'll we'll just keep using that <laughs> until we can <laughs> Uh, so I, <laughs> I was saying basically that it's a central nervous system depressant, so like other central nervous system depressants, it can work temporarily. Unfortunately, it habituates a lot faster than the others, so alcohol will stop working and will require higher and higher doses a lot more quickly than clonazepam can. That's one. Two, there are particular subtypes of dystonia, Dr. Prashir and uh, Dr. Tate were mentioning, that can respond to alcohol, but they're not cervical dystonia. So myoclonus dystonia can respond very nicely to alcohol, for example. Great, thank you. Um, interesting question. How many people are misdiagnosed with dystonia? You know, um, that's really hard to say. Right. This is Allison. Um, I mean, there are patients who went years without being diagnosed. Um, that is rare now because of the work of people like the DMRF and other organizations and physicians and such. And we also have treatments that we didn't have before. So. It's really hard to put a number on that. I think um, every person has to be treated as an individual case. Okay. And and uh, do um, you have an opinion on, or what do you think of hyperbaric therapy for dystonia? So we don't recommend hyperbaric therapy for dystonia here. Um, I'm not aware of any large academic medical centers that are doing that at this time. Okay, thank you. And then I think one final question. Um, what is the role of botulinum toxin in treating runner's dystonia? Oh, nice. There you go. Um, oh, you'll, uh, I, <laughs> uh, I mean, it can work very nicely. Uh, runner's dystonia tends to be a focal dystonia uh, if one induced by a particular set of motions. So when you don't have a whole lot of muscles involved and it's not spreading, then uh, Botox is probably going to help. Now, since it's popping up in people typically who are, are athletic, um, you know, you can end up literally putting a crimp in someone's style by giving them a little bit more than they can handle, and then your running will be off, but it will treat the dystonia quite nicely. Like other Botox amenable dystonias, it's a matter of finding the right balance. Great. Thank you. Uh, I just uh, want to thank um, each of you, Dr. Brashear, Dr. Hauk, and Dr. Tate, for sharing part of your evening with us and, and your expertise. We're uh, tremendously grateful to you. Um, not only for uh, the presentations tonight, but for the work that you do every day in helping the dystonia community. I also want to thank our, our guests, our participants, and the wonderful questions that they posed. As 
uh, as predicted, unfortunately, we weren't able to get to all of them, but um, really terrific questions. Uh, and thank you to our, our panel for your flexibility um, in managing our technical difficulties. We apologize for those. So um, thank you, everyone. Uh, we wish you a good evening, and we look forward to having people uh, explore this resource once it's posted on the DMRF website. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you.